Hi everyone, I'm Amy Fitzgerald. Um, I wanted to say a quick hi before I share my video, uh, my screen rather, because then you'll lose the, uh, the video feed of me. Um, I'm coming to you from my basement in Ontario, Canada. And hopefully, wherever you're, you are, you're comfortable. Here, we're having a heat wave right now. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking to you about the research that I've been conducting on animal abuse and interpersonal violence. And, and most specifically, I'm going to focus on the recent work I've been conducting on the relationship between animal abuse and intimate partner violence. And I thought I would start out with this quote here, and, and this is from a special issue of the journal Hypatia that was published almost 10 years ago now. And in it, Emily Clark wrote, I wonder what might be lost when animal studies and attention to species are framed or shadowed by the human, when I or other feminist animal scholars must always justify or explain or ground our work with attention to the human and with the ready answer to the question, what does this have to do with gender? Um, and we can also add in there, what does this have to do with the human? Um, what might be gained by thinking or at least attempting otherwise? And I take her point, um, but I, I do wonder what would have been lost if we didn't have scholars who were documenting the connections between human and animal well-being. Uh, and the flip side of that, harm. And so I, I wanted to position my work and give you a sense of the trajectory that my research um, has been on and, and how, it, uh, how I started where I did. And to situate that, I thought that I should start by explaining that I began my graduate work at the turn of the century, which feels weird to say. Um, and at the time, I was an animal advocate, ethical vegan, and I was looking for graduate programs where I could pursue those interests, and I couldn't find any. Um, I ended up in environmental sociology at Michigan State University because I thought at least with environmental sociology that would get me fairly close to my interest in non-human animals, and um, you know it Within that program, there, there was a contingent focused on human dimensions of wildlife research. So I thought, well, that, you know, that will at least get me close to uh, pursuing my interest in animals. And then, fortunately, Linda Kaloff and Tom Dietz, who some of you um, might know or might at least know of their names, um, they joined the department while I was there. I think I was in my second year. Uh, of my graduate of my graduate work there, and I was very fortunate because they gave me the freedom to do what I wanted. Um, I actually did a comprehensive exam on animal studies, um, and later after I graduated, Linda started the animal studies um, program there, and so I was I was really fortunate. Um, to be given the, the leeway to do what I wanted and to pursue the research that I was interested in, um, you know, right at the get-go of my graduate uh, work. So you might be wondering why I'm telling you this. Um, well, because I wanted to emphasize that at that point in time, um, the time period that I was working in really greatly influenced the trajectory of my work. And I made a decision long ago um, to focus my work on the intersection of harms between animals and people because I felt like that would be where I would be able to make a contribution, that the work that I had done as an animal activist, um, you know, it, it was frustrating because at times it felt like it wasn't having a significant impact. And so I saw human self-interest as the best way to get people to take harms against animals seriously. And, um, and I do sincerely believe that in order to achieve species justice, we're going to need to simultaneously pursue social and environmental justice. So to this end, my work has examined the connections between um, top areas of animal harm and human harm. I've conducted projects 
on slaughterhouse employment levels and crime rates in communities, use of prisoners in animal agriculture, um, among other things. And as I mentioned at the outset, today I'm going to give you an overview of the recent work I've done on the co-occurrence of animal abuse and intimate partner violence. Now, because of time constraints, I'm really not going to be able to delve into much of the detail and theory and methodology, and I'll just be giving you kind of a, a bird's eye view here. Before I started, though, I wanted to um, give acknowledgements to the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council in Canada um, that has continued to support this work and Creative Commons for the photograph I'll be using, and also my wonderful colleagues at the University of Windsor in the Animal and Interpersonal Abuse Research Group, um, who you know, various members have contributed to parts of the, the work that I'll be talking about today. So first I'm going to talk about some work that um, Betty Barrett and I have conducted looking at clients in domestic violence shelter staff, um, domestic violence shelters and also staff. So we conducted surveys with both. Then I'll move on to talk about um, more recent research we've conducted using the Canadian General Social Survey, and then talk about our census of domestic violence pet program in Canada and the U.S., and some of the uh, most recent work that I've been doing on legislative responses um, to all of these, um, these connections that, that I'm going to be talking about. Okay, so the work that we've done with clients and shelter staff. Um, as some of you may be aware, Carol Adams in the 1990s was writing about the potential instrumentalization of animal abuse to harm the human victims of intimate partner violence. Um, and in the 19, later in the 1990s, Frank Ashioni began empirically documenting the relationship between animal abuse and intimate partner violence. And what he found at the time with some small domestic violence shelter samples was that there was, um, there was a high proportion of participants in his studies, so individuals who were residing in domestic violence shelters, who reported that their partners were also abusing their pets. Um, but as with any body of developing scholarship at the time, there were methodological limitations, so small samples, no controls, um, the work was shelter-based, so it was hard to know what the, um, what the proportion of animal abuse was among the general population, so were the, the levels that he was documenting in domestic violence shelters significant, statistically significantly higher than among the general population. Um, so these were all questions that still needed to be answered and um, also of concern to Canadian shelters and funders, we didn't have Canadian data. So my colleague Betty Barrett and I thought to address some of these limitations and conducted a study throughout um, across Canada. So we had 17 different domestic violence shelters that participated across the country. And through those shelters, we were able to survey 100 victims and 116 staff members. And so I'll, I'll just give you um, an overview of our main findings and emphasize what the, what the importance of these findings are. So um, we found that, not surprisingly, pets are common. So in our sample, 63% of the clients reported having companion animals. And unfortunately, animal maltreatment uh, was common. So um, earlier studies in the US with uh, samples and shelters there had documented a co-occurrence of somewhere between 25 and 75%, um, large variation, um, which I'll, I'll talk about shortly. And our study documented a co-occurrence of 89%. So 89% of our respondents were reporting that their partner had engaged in some mistreatment of their pets. 
And on the next slide, I'll, I'll show you how we measured um, that animal maltreatment. But before I move to the next slide, I just wanted to um, explain that we also found that animal maltreatment is a marker of severity when it comes to intimate partner violence. So in our sample, those who reported more than four incidents of animal maltreatment were at the greatest risk of severe psychological, physical, and sexual intimate partner violence. We also included a group um, in our study who were, were victims of intimate partner violence, but who didn't have pets. Um, and interestingly, we found that they reported that the among the groups that we compared, it was those who had pets that were not abused, that were themselves at the least amount of risk of severe intimate partner violence. Um, so that tells us something about, you know, sometimes in the literature, animal abuse is framed as a, a red flag, if you will, for human violence. Um, but it, at least in our study, we found that having a pet and not, uh, not having animal abuse, so a perpetrator not engaging in animal abuse, indicates that those humans might be at less risk of severe intimate partner violence. Um, but where there, where there was animal abuse, as I mentioned, more than four incidents, um, there was significant risk of severe intimate partner violence. So this is how we measured animal maltreatment. Um, and re remember, I, I said in the earlier studies, the proportion uh, of animal abuse ranged from 25% to around 75%. And that's a huge uh, range. And part of the reason for that uh, that range, we believe, is that pe researchers were measuring animal maltreatment differently. So some researchers were including threats against pets. Some researchers were just asking a question about physical animal abuse. Um, and we found that researchers really weren't asking a lot of questions on average about animal maltreatment and asking questions like, did your partner abuse your pet? And one thing we know from the literature on intimate partner violence is that if you ask victims if they've been a victim of a specific type of abuse, like um, physical intimate partner abuse, they might not respond in the affirmative. But if you ask behavior-based questions, um, they're more likely to endorse those items. And so they might not self-identify as being a victim of this type of abuse, but when you look at the behaviors that they've been subjected to, um, then it becomes apparent that they were subjected to uh, intimate partner abuse. So instead of asking if partners had abused their pet, we asked questions to tap into areas such as emotional animal abuse, threats to harm animals, physical neglect, physical abuse, and severe physical abuse. Um, and we asked, I've given you some examples here of the type of questions we ask. So for instance, um, for physical abuse, we asked questions about smacking a pet. We asked questions specifically about drowning pets um, to better assess whether or not individuals had experienced these types of, of harm. And as I mentioned, um, the vast majority of our, our sample did, 89%. So we also were interested in assessing what the impact is on help seeking and not just determining, you know, what the rate of co-occurrence is. And what we found is that in our sample, 56% reported they delayed leaving their abuser because they couldn't take their pet to shelters. Um, so those of you who are unfamiliar with domestic violence shelters, um, historically, you couldn't bring pets to shelters by and large um, because they didn't have the, um, the capacities and some argued that um, it would be a violation of uh, health codes, etc., to allow animals on site. Later in the presentation, I'll talk about how this is fortunately 
uh, changing. But unfortunately, 56% reported delaying leaving. Um, we also found that um, those who reported that they delayed leaving, when we statistically controlled for the length of the relationship and the severity of the intimate partner violence they have been subjected to, we actually we found out that those who reported delaying leaving were most likely to report that they um, were victimized by severe intimate partner violence. So not only does this point to a problem in people delaying leaving abusers because of pets, but also according to um, our sample at least, it's those, um, those individuals who delay leaving are at greatest risk of severe abuse themselves. Unfortunately, many um, in our sample were forced to leave their pets with their abuser. 60% of our sample reported they ended up uh, leaving the pet with the abuser, and a third of those told us that they were considering returning to the abuser because he still had their pet. Um, so again, a, a significant safety concern um, for not only adults going back to abusive relationships, but also children uh, who will accompany them. Also, um, what worries me is that we don't know how many individuals will never leave an abusive relationship because of their pets, um, because they don't have the option to take their pets with them to a shelter. Um, we did ask staff in our survey with them if they were aware of any individuals in the community who had refused to go to shelter because of their pets and three quarters of our sample of staff indicated that yes, they, they were aware of individuals who had refused to go to shelter specifically because they couldn't take their pets with them. So in short, abuse victims are in a bind. They're likely to have companion animals. These companion animals are likely to be abused. The abuse increases their desire to leave. Um, the animal abuse increases the desire of the human victims to leave, but also results in delayed leaving because of concern for their pet, because in most areas they can't take their pet with them to the shelter. And um, it also creates an interest in returning to abusers um, because they still have their pets in many situations. And Unfortunately, um, they can use that as leverage to get victim, human victims and survivors back into the relationship. So we also asked questions about why these forms of violence co-occur, um, about their perception, so why they think their abuser harmed their pet. The dominant explanation in the literature revolves around power and control. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, in the 1990s, Carol Adams had been writing about the use of pets um, it, as part of this cycle of power and control. Some of you might be familiar with the power and control wheel, which is an intervention tool that was developed in the 1990s. And here, pets were included uh, right at, under intimidation, right after destroying her property an implicit grouping of animals with property destruction. Um, and historically, in the intimate partner violence literature, animals have been, um, animal abuse has been categorized as a form of property abuse. Um, and I'll, as I'll, I'll mention shortly, that, um, that's something that we've, we've looked to assess. So does animal abuse actually cluster with uh, property abuse. So are there empirical reasons for grouping them together? So I'll talk about that shortly when I talk about our work with the general social survey. So as we asked questions about why they felt their uh, abuser had harmed their pet, and um, we asked questions around intentionality, motivation, and we found in our analyses that these measures did um, were consistent predictors of emotional animal abuse, threats against the pet, and neglect. When we controlled for the forms of abuse, the human victims 
um, were subjected to, age and race and ethnicity. But what was interesting is that these variables didn't have the same explanatory power to explain physical animal abuse. So what that means is that the, the human victims and survivors weren't necessarily viewing their abusers, abuse of the animals as motivated by power and control as much as they were for emotional animal abuse, threat, and neglect. So why might that be? Um, we're not sure, to be honest with you, and so I'll go through some of our, our theories. Um, and these are areas that we're, we're following up, up on in our, our current research. So it's possible that when someone's um, using threats against a pet or emotional abuse or neglect, um, it's, it's easier to perceive them as being motivated by power and control. So they might be more likely to contain ultimatums. Um, it's also possible that severe animal abuse, so it, it might not be um, instrumentalized to the extent that the other forms of animal abuse are because it risks annihilating the instrument of control. So there might be some important differences here, uh, which is why our distinction between these forms of animal maltreatment we think might be really important instead of just grouping it all together as, you know, has your partner ever harmed or threatened to harm your pet? Um, we think that disaggregating it will, you know, result in interesting um, nuanced differences that we wouldn't have caught if we had just been using, you know, a few questions about threats and physical abuse. Another possible reason it could be related to a pattern of escalating abuse. This is um, an area where we need further research. So among our sample, only 0.5% said that they felt the abuse de-escalated over time, um, but there weren't, there weren't significant relationships around um, escalation. So some felt like it had remained rather static, some felt it had escalated, and this is an area where we need further research with larger samples, and that's something that um, we're currently, um, we just recently launched a larger scale study um, to assess these questions. Also could be related to subtypes of abusers. So um, the domestic violence intimate partner abuse literature in recent years has talked about different subtypes of abusers, and this might be important. Um, you know, we some tend to cast abusers um, as one, you know, one type, um, but recent research indicates that there are different types, um, and some of the research has pointed to two main types. So those motivated by dependency and jealousy, and those who are more generally antisocial. So it's possible, again, this is just, you know, theorizing at this point, but it's possible that those who engage in instrumentalized animal abuse might fall into this dependent jealous subtype. And those who fall into the antisocial intimate terrorist group, um, are, these are individuals who are more likely to be violent outside of the family and could be more, gen more likely to be generalized animal abusers. So their abuse might be perceived as being more explosive um, and less pre-planned, premeditated, and motivated by power and control. Okay, so that gives you a snapshot of that work. I also wanted to briefly touch on some work that we've done with the General Social Survey here in Canada. We were able to um, consult with Statistics Canada to have a question about animal abuse added. Um, and this was really helpful because remember earlier when I was talking about the methodological limitations, um, one of the main limitations is that most of the work had focused on domestic violence shelters and some had critiqued that um, approach and said that, you know, domestic violence shelters are where you're more likely to see the extreme abuse cases. And so maybe the relationship between animal abuse 
in intimate partner violence isn't as, you know, isn't there um, among other sam other groups of victims that don't go to shelters. So what the general social survey data allowed us to do is to look at a representative sample of the general population and to see if animal abuse co-occurs um, with intimate partner violence. And it also allowed us to look at, to include samples of those who identify as women and those who identify as men. Whereas the, the research prior to that um, had been focused almost exclusively on those who self-identify as women. Okay, so um, what we found was that animal abuse is significantly more common among those who report physical intimate partner violence. And again, this is among the general population, so not just those who have gone to shelter. So among those with pets who reported no animal maltreatment, only 4% reported they had been victimized by physical intimate partner abuse themselves. Whereas when we looked at those who, whereas 50% of those who reported animal maltreatment also reported physical intimate partner violence. So these were statistically significant differences. We also found that animal abuse is associated with increased probability of injury and fearing for one's life. So when we controlled for sociodemographic variables, we found that there's a 16% increased probability of injury and 25% increased probability of fearing for one's life. So also important findings that animal abuse, um, you know, not only indicates that there's a great, greater likelihood that there's intimate partner abuse, but also greater likelihood that it's uh, severe intimate partner abuse. We also found a very large co-occurrence with emotional abuse, so 38% overlap there. And as I mentioned earlier, we were also interested to look to see if it co-occurred with property abuse because animal abuse um, has been linked, you know, tied in the literature, it's been cast as a form of property abuse. What we found was that there was only a small relationship there animal abuse only accounted for a 7% increase risk of property abuse. Um, we also wanted to see if it linked to threats and harms to people outside of the intimate relationship, and we only found a 4% increase there. So what we think this shows is that animals occupy a liminal space between property and personhood, um, at least as far as how abuse is perpetrated in the context of intimate partner relationships in the general uh, Canadian population. We also looked at how it's linked to help seeking using the GSS data. And um, we found that it's because it's likely to occur, you know, among this um, group of severe intimate partner violence, um, it's possible that survivors in this context are more likely to be isolated and under the surveillance of the perpetrator, which may make it more likely and easier for individuals to speak informally um, about what they're experiencing. So we found that it's more likely uh, those who report animal abuse are more likely to report reaching out for informal assistance. So with family and friends um, than they are with uh, reaching out with formal services uh, like domestic violence shelters. So that's, that's important. Um, and that's one reason why we've been focused on trying to increase public awareness um, so that individuals are aware of this relationship between animal abuse and intimate partner violence and how significant it is and how it can be a barrier for leaving an abusive relationship. So we partnered with Red Rover, um, which is a, a charity in the US that some of you might be familiar with, and um, created these posters um, that we're disseminating to pet supply stores and veterinary clinics uh, around um, 
the U.S. and Canada to try to raise awareness about this relationship for survivors, but also for loved ones so that if they are approached by someone in this situation, they can help them uh, leave safely with their pets. Because, and it, this takes me to um, another project I wanted to just briefly touch on, um, the situation in domestic violence shelters is improving. Increasingly, in recent years, we've seen more on-site programs and more off-site programs developed, and I listed some of them here, um, some of the forms that they can take. But still, um, unfortunately, a number of people live in jurisdictions where there aren't programs available. And I will say this is one area where the, the U.S. is ahead of us here in Canada. You have more, um, more programs available for pets there per capita than, than we have here. Here's a, a lovely picture of uh, an on-site program for cats. So these can be very nice. They can be really, you know, fancy like this, or they can be really modest, um, like just, you know, allowing a pet cat in specific um, rooms for clients in the shelter. So what we did was we partnered with Red Rover because they had a database um, that was a searchable map that people could use to search for pet program availability, but it needed updating. Um, and it also didn't extend into Canada. So we partnered with them and uh, we contacted every domestic violence shelter in Canada and the US. And we asked them questions about the pet programs they had available, also um, about barriers they perceived to implementing these types of programs, whether or not they asked about pets at intake, if they include pets. Um, when they talk to individuals on the phone or in person about safety planning. And here's our response rates and our, our number that participated. So approximately, you know, 42, 43% across the board uh, response rate, which is pretty good in, in, as far as, you know, research goes. Um, but I want to emphasize this means that our findings are only relevant for the group that responded, right? So I think it's fair to say that we can assume our findings, our sample is biased, right? Because those who um, are more, those who have pet programs in place are likely, more likely to respond to a request for participation. Um, uh, for information about the importance of pet programs, right? So it is, it's biased in, in that respect. So I, I want to acknowledge that. Um, so this gives you a graphic illustration of, you know, when pets, when shelters are asking uh, proactively about uh, pets when individuals call for services. Unfortunately, the largest um, portion of this pie here, the 38%, it's never, um, so we still have significant work to do um, because individuals, you know, if they're not being proactively asked, uh, I'm concerned that, and, you know, in proportion or case by case here as well. So you see case by case for clients and staff. So what that means is if the client brings it up or if the staff brings it up, the problem is, and this is something I emphasize when I talk to domestic violence shelters, is you can't leave it up to them to volunteer this information uh, because there is a stigma uh, attached to acknowledging that you remained in a, an abusive relationship, especially if there are children involved, uh, for the safety of your pets, right? So we need to get better about proactively asking these questions. Um, at intake and safety planning. So you see here, you know, it's, I was heartened to see that shelters increasingly are seeing that this is really important to ask these questions uh, about pets, but there's still a large proportion that aren't asked um, and, you know, aren't formally included in safety planning. Um, and so it's kind of done at an ad hoc 
um, on an ad hoc basis for a large number of shelters, um, which, as I mentioned, you know, leaves a number um, that could fall through the cracks. All right. Um, yeah, so this illustrates that, unfortunately, still approximately 50% don't have routine questions about pets um, for intake and safety planning. So this is just a snapshot of what the pet services look like. So on-site shelf, on-site programming, 25% um, of the shelters that responded to our request for participation report that they do on-site on sheltering, which is great. Um, you know, in our work with victims and survivors, they've indicated that on-site is preferred. Um, but that being said, off-site is also helpful, right? Because some individuals come to shelters with animals that can't be accommodated on-site. Um, so like, you know, large animals like horses, for instance, or um, aggressive dogs, right? Or animals that don't do well um, in, you know, a kenneling situation, for instance, if the shelter only has a, a kennel. Um, so off-site can be really helpful in, you know, filling in um, where on-site doesn't work. So ideally, I'd like to see on-site and off-site available in, um, in all jurisdictions. So as I mentioned, we use this information to populate this database. So you can go to safeplacerepets.org. Um, I'd appreciate it if you could share this information um, so that you know individuals in abusive relationships will have access to it, they'll know it exists, so they can search for programs in their community or at least nearby um, you know, that can help them get out of abusive relationships. And as I mentioned, sharing the information also, you know, can help to educate the public about the importance of um, offering to assist individuals with their pets if they're in an abusive relationship. It can really, you know, mean the difference between life and death for, um, for the animals and also for the people involved. All right, so the last um, bit of work that I've been doing that I wanted to touch on is the legislative responses. So one thing that, that's been really heartening about this area of research is that we're really starting to see significant policy and uh, legislative changes in response to the research indicating that there is a significant relationship between animal abuse and intimate partner violence and um, especially that you know individuals are at risk, animals are being killed. 20% of our sample reported their partner had killed uh, at least one of their pets. So it's really important that we have shelters developing policies to help get individuals out of these abusive situations, but also um, there have been some legislative responses that, that I'm going to talk to you about but before I do that, I, I wanted to take a step back and talk a bit about um, Kim Licka. Some of you are probably familiar with uh, Kim Licka and Donaldson's work on citizen animal citizenship. Um, and one thing that Kim Licka has talked about is a, a social recognition strategy in arguing that, you know, the best strategic way forward um, might be to gain acknowledgement um, for, group, for groups of animals. So he's linked the proposition of animal citizenship um, more directly to animal law and suggested that the basis, perhaps the best strategic basis for legal reform to get beyond the you know, property versus personhood impasse is this social recognition strategy. So what this is, is that he argues that we'll be more likely to recognize animals um, as you know having rights and benefits uh, akin to people once we've recognized them as family members and co-workers. So he's identified these two categories as in particular as holding promise as family members and workers. 
Um, and there has been some progress, right, with these categories. So, for instance, with fam as family members, you know, there's been progress made in custody arrangements, tort cases, where animals have been viewed as, you know, moving beyond um, simple property, right? Their interests are at least starting um, to, to come into play um, more often. Workers, there's also been some progress here, especially with uh, rights for working animals, um, such as, you know, dogs working with police and the military. So what I'm arguing, um, starting to develop these ar this argument, is that domestic animals caught up in domestic violence clearly fit into the first two categories that Kim Lick has identified. Um, so they're clearly family members, um, you know, participants are, are very adamant about the importance of their companion animals, how they've helped them even, you know, with their own um, suicidality. Um, they've also, I, I would argue, performed a, a work function that these animals could be conceived as as working animals, they provide emotional support um, and they reciprocate. Um, these are reciprocal relationships through caretaking where, you know, domestic violence victims will talk about how their pets kept them going. Um, and in response, they, you know, they didn't um, take their own lives because of concern for their pets because they felt a caretaking obligation to them. So you can see there's a reciprocal relationship here. And increasingly, we're starting to acknowledge that they're also co-victims in this context. Um, and this is very important. This victimization, the shared victimhood, not only facilitates empathy among the human victims in that situation, but also among society more generally, right? Um, that individuals are find it easier to empathize with these animals when you explain the situations that they've been in um, as co-victims in domestic violence situations. And some provinces and states are starting to acknowledge this through um, legislative efforts, like including companion animals, um, you know, usually using the term pets, in definitions of domestic violence, and increasingly including them in protection orders, um, which I think is, is really important because it's going to facilitate uh, leaving abusive relationships with these companion animals. Legally, as I'm sure you're aware, animals are considered property um, still, but in these protection orders, um, some of them in some states, and I'll give you some examples, have started to um, perhaps undercut the property status of animals. So this is just a, a graph that I did up so that you can see the increasing trend in um, including pets and definitions of um, domestic violence, and in protection orders. It's also an interesting illustration of bipartisanship. I, I know there isn't a whole lot of that in the US uh, in recent years, but this is a notable exception. Um, you can see an increasing bipartisanship shift in recent years in support of these bills. Um, so moving from mostly partisan Democrat, uh, Democrat back bills to more bipartisan and Republican back bills. Okay, so I want to wrap up. I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples here so that you can see how these, um, these pieces of legislation are wording the protections. So here's an example from North Carolina. So it provides for the care, custody, and control of any animal owned, possessed, kept, or held as a pet by either party or a minor child. So this is important because it's not just um, the, the pet of the victim, 
um, that can be protected under a protection order, but also even if it's the abuser's pet, even if the abuser can prove, right, that they bought this animal, um, they can be protected under this protection order. Also, um, the protection orders can direct a party to refrain from abuse of, um, of these animals, which again is important because it protects um, these animals and it also protects the human victims, right? It takes that leverage away. And okay, so the next one I wanted to show you here is Alaska, which is also really interesting. Um, so here it sets out that police have to notify victims about, um, about these rights. And one is that you can be granted possession of a vehicle and other essential personal items, including a pet, regardless of ownership. So it's not, you know, ideal. It's because they're grouping them with uh, possessions like vehicles. But you notice other essential personal items, including a pet. Um, so they're, it's moving a bit away from property regardless of ownership, which is, I think is the really critical part there. So again, individuals, even if the abuser owns the animal, that animal can be taken away uh, from the abuser. This next part is really interesting to me, and that is that you, the abuser can be required to pay support to the adult victim, the minor child, or a pet. So, this is an important shift um, from just conceptualizing animals as victims, as sorry, as property here, right? We're seeing them acknowledged more as victims. And this was, you know, this was essential to, to do based on the research that's demonstrated that these animals aren't being abused as property, right? They're being abused as victims, as ways to, you know, instrumentalize to harm the human victims um, and also impacting the ability of those human victims to get out of these, um, these dangerous situations. So, of course, judges will have discretion here in how they use um, the legislation and I'm currently analyzing um, cases that are um, citing these protection order uh, pieces of legislation. I also wanted to acknowledge um, the, PAW, the Pet and Women's Safety Act that was enacted in the U.S. in 2018. Some of you might be familiar with it. It really is helpful because it provides um, a fund that shelter, domestic violence shelters can apply to, to fund pet programs. And it also recommends including pets in protection orders. Um, that states implement laws to do this, which I think is really exciting. And now at my last count, there are 35 states um, that include pet, make it possible to include pets and in protection orders. Um, so again, it's, it's another example of the way that the U.S. is actually ahead of us here in Canada. Um, and we, we need to, um, we need to play catch up here. Uh, which is something that I've I've been working on. So to wrap up, I just wanted to emphasize then the, the main point is that the legislation in some jurisdictions are now making it possible to include animals in protection orders regardless of ownership and also regardless of mistreatment. So this is different from animal protection regulations that, you know, if you're mistreating your pet, um, the animal can be taken from you. In these protection order situations, there doesn't, in, in many states, you don't have to demonstrate that there was mistreatment of that pet, right? So this is really important. It's a, it's a way of preventing abuse instead of responding to abuse. Um, and in the case of Alaska and hopefully subsequent um, states, you can be required to pay pet support. Um, if a pet is taken from you in a, a protection order situation. So it's possible that wording some of the, the wording in some of these pieces of legislation could open the door to distinguishing between animals as property and being held as a pet 
Um, so there's an interesting shift, I think, that's taking place here. Um, we're moving from conceptualizing animals strictly as property and being part of, you know, the cycle of abuse against human victims in property destruction, right? We're increasingly seeing animals being moved out of that property destruction category, which is really important, and moved into, um, you know, a, being acknowledged more as as kin um, and as, as li like children, right? Especially this requirement to pay support for their care. So I wanted to tie it all together and, and wrap up with a picture to leave you with. And this is a picture from Hurricane Katrina. Uh, and research that was conducted after the hurricane found that um, over 40% of those who didn't evacuate reported that their pets were a factor. Um, so if you'll recall, at the time of Hurricane Katrina, you couldn't take your pet to emergency shelters. And so this really put people in a dangerous situation where they were forced to choose between their own safety and their pet safety, and many people remained uh, in a dangerous situation because of concerns for their pets. Fortunately, emergency shelter regulations and government funding were changed as a result of this acknowledgement. But this image I think is really powerful because it visually depicts the intersection of human and animal well-being. And going back to Clark's quote at the beginning of my talk, where she laments the need for animal studies to link itself to, to humans. Um, as I said, you know, I, I sympathize um, with the argument and as someone who has had to justify their work for the past two decades by demonstrating how it connects to human interests, uh, you know, I, I definitely um, empathize with it. But I think empirically and strategically that these are important connections to make. Um, and they can help us not only understand hum human behavior and cultures, but also to make improvements for animals and to increasingly put animal issues front and center for policymakers and legislators. And I'm hoping that some of that attention will, um, will generalize to other human, um, other animal interests. So I will stop sharing my screen here and thank you for your attention I wish I could have been there in person um, hopefully you know hope to meet you all in person one day and uh, good luck with all of your projects